Oh, hello. Good morning, guys. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. It's a beautiful day. Hope you're doing well. I'm your host, Clifford Sargent. Getting back to it. All right. Man, every... Man. Every now and then you're amazed to find something you completely underestimated or overlooked. And sometimes it seems like that is the only reason to keep on living, because you are too stupid to figure the whole thing out. <laughs> um, this is for Logan, a man who's off in Africa doing his job somewhere. Thanks a lot for the recommendation, man. This is Stoner by John Williams. <clears throat> yes, many of you have recommended Stoner, and you're all very nice and pretty, and I really appreciate it. But uh, why did I thank Logan? Because he tipped my ass! Thanks, man. You can tip the hell out of me, too. Using Patreon or PayPal or just going on my website and following the link to Amazon to go and purchase the book, which you can also find in the description box below. The more you tip, the more in the line you get up there. And I will review the book. If I like it, of course. If I don't like it, I will tell you why I didn't like it. Or I will do my best to describe why I did not enjoy it. Which does not necessarily mean it wasn't a good book. There are plenty of great books that I did not enjoy whatsoever. Stoner was published in 1965 by an American author named John Williams. Referring to Stoner, a critic wrote that it is something rarer than a great novel. It is a perfect novel. So well told and beautifully written, so deeply moving, it takes your breath away. Something I noticed in the, the, the critics, you know, the, the little lines from like, oh, the New Yorker, or like this, or, or Times, or whatever, you know, the little critics lines for the book. Uh, taking your breath away was the one constant in, in many of them. Sometimes it was just like one line, like, takes your breath away. I was like, okay. um, people have a hard time describing what is so wonderful about Stoner. And I'm one of them, of course, so this is going to be the review of a complete dilettante, but I'm going to, I'm going to, do, I'm going to do my damnedest because this is, <laughs> you just need to go and read this fucking book. It's just great. It is just a fucking gem. Yeah, books like this make life worth living. But anyways, referring to what the critic said, I couldn't agree more with it. The writing is so effectively sincere that you're almost repelled, at least for me, in the beginning. Like someone who seems incredibly kind, too kind, like somebody who's about to sell you on some really stupid shit. But no, it really is just that great. Its natural rhythm is addictive. And the treatment of situations and emotions mirrors the experiences of real life. At least for me in a way that very, 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 very few books really do. But a little bit about John. John Williams was a professor from Texas. Only wrote a handful, less than a handful of novels in his time. He was a professor, he got his PhD in English literature, and he was just steeped in academia. And in, in 1985, he was asked in this interview, um, I got this from Wikipedia, so it might be, might be true, might be not, I have to check the sources, but I would believe it, he said. The interviewer asked, the interviewer asked John, uh, and literature is written to be entertaining? To which John emphatically replied, Absolutely. My God, to read without joy is stupid. Initially, you're led to believe that our main character, William Stoner, has nothing to do with pot, obviously. William Stoner, the main character, has led an unfulfilling, dull, and depressing existence, forgotten by most and remembered by few. When Thoreau wrote, most men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them, that is the exact impression you are given from the get-go of our protagonist. By the end of the novel, a metamorphosis has taken place, and you're astounded to find one of the most human protagonists ever written. It's as, if, it's as if you project your own romanticized notions onto what is really an unromantic scenario. 
and it's just honest real life but it's romantic because it's unromantic I don't know it is undoubtedly a desert island book I don't have the vocabulary, the maturity, or the experience to describe what the book feels like, or, or, or to describe it to the, to the measure that it deserves. It's an honest portrait of a man who has tried his best to deal with the mistakes that he has made, keep his integrity, and love those who are close to him. William Stoner in the book is sort of haunted by the memory of his friend, David Masters, who died shortly after joining the war when he was the same, same age as him, when they were when they were hanging out together in the pub when they were in their early 20s. Masters had seemingly figured out the role of the university institution before Stoner even started his career in it. There is a scene that takes place when Stoner is still young in a bar together with Masters and another character who will have later significance named Gordon Finch. I'm going to read you this little piece. This is just... And this is pretty early on in the book, too. And I hope I'm not going to spoil it too much, but... Anyways. So, you know, here we are in the bar, the three of them, Finch, Stoner, and Masters. Masters holding aloft a hard-boiled egg from the free lunch as if it were a crystal ball, said, Have you gentlemen ever considered the question of the true nature of the university? Mr. Stoner, Mr. Finch. Smiling, they shook their heads. I'll bet you haven't. Stoner here, I imagine, sees it as a great repository, like a library or a whorehouse, where men come of their free will and select that which will complete them, where all work together like little bees in a common hive. The true, the good, the beautiful, they're just around the corner, in the next corridor. They're in the next book, the one you haven't read, or in the next stack, the one you haven't got to, and you'll get to it someday, and when you do, when you do. He looked at the egg for a moment more, then took a large bite of it and turned to Stoner, his jaws working and his eyes, his dark eyes bright. Stoner smiled uncomfortably and Finch laughed aloud and slapped the table. He's got you, Bill. He's got you good. Masters chewed for a moment more, swallowed and turned his gaze to Finch. And you, Finch, what's your idea? He held up his hand. You'll protest you haven't thought of it, but you have. Beneath that bluff and hearty exterior, there works a simple mind. To you, the institution is an instrument of good. To the world at large, of course, and just incidentally, to yourself. You see it as a kind of spiritual sulfur and molasses that you administer every fall to get the little bastards through another winter. And you're the kindly old doctor who benignly pats their heads and pockets their fees. Finch laughed again and shook his head. I swear, Dave, when you get going. Masters put the rest of the egg in his mouth, chewed contentedly for a moment, and took another long swallow of beer. But you're both wrong, he said. It is an asylum, or what do they call them now? A rest home for the infirm, the aged, the discontent, and the otherwise incompetent. Look at the three of us. We are the university. A stranger would not know that we have so much in common, but we know, don't we? We know well. Finch was laughing. What's that, Dave? Interested now in what he was saying, Masters leaned in tentatively across the table. Let's take you first, Finch. Being as kind as I can, I would say that you are the incompetent. As you yourself know, you're not really very bright, though that doesn't have everything to do with it. Here now, Finch said, still laughing. But you're bright enough. You're just bright enough to realize what would happen to you in the world. You're cut out for failure, and you know it. Though you're capable of being a son of a bitch, you're not quite ruthless enough to be so consistently. Though you're not precisely the most honest man I've ever known, neither are you heroically dishonest. On the one hand, you're capable of work, but you're just lazy enough so that you can't work as hard as the world will want you to. On the other hand, you're not quite so lazy that you can impress upon the world a sense of your importance, and you're not lucky, not really. No aura rises from you, and you wear a puzzled expression. In the world, you would always be on the fringe of success, and you would be destroyed by your failure. So you are chosen, elected, providence, whose humor, whose sense of humor has always amused me, has snatched you away from the jaws of the world, and placed you safely here, 
among your brothers. Still smiling and ironically malevolent, he turned to Stoner. Nor do you escape, my friend. No, indeed. Who are you? A simple son of the soil, as you pretend to yourself. Oh, no. You, too, are among the infirm. You are the dreamer, the madman in a madder world, our own Midwestern Don Quixote, without his Sancho, gambling under the blue sky. You're bright enough, brighter anyhow than our mutual friend, but you have the taint, the old infirmity. You think there's something here, something to find. Well, in the world you learn soon enough. Well, in the world you learn soon enough. You, too, are cut out for failure, not that you'd fight the world. You'd let, it chew, you, you'd let it chew you up and spit you out. And you'd lie there wondering what was wrong. Because you'd always expect the world to be something it wasn't. Something it had no wish to be. The weevil and the cotton. The worm and the beanstalk. The borer and the corn. You couldn't face them. And you couldn't fight them. Because you're too weak. And you're too strong. And you have no place to go in the world. Man. I don't know if it gets better than that. Yeah, yeah. That's some of the best. For those of you who read The Recognitions by Gaddis is actually a similar that reminds me of a similar rant of a character in that, but we'll get to the we'll get to the recognitions later. Anyways. These passages are nothing short of succinctly magnificent. It would seem like the writing style would come off as cold in the hands of anyone else, but with Williams, it's the opposite. In his extreme youth, Stoner had thought of love as an absolute state of being to which, if one were lucky, one might find access. In his maturity, he had decided it was the heaven of a false religion, toward which one ought to gaze with an amused disbelief, a gently familiar contempt, and an embarrassed nostalgia. Now in his middle age, he began to know that it was neither a state of grace nor an illusion. He saw it as a human act of becoming, a condition that was invented and modified moment by moment and day by day by the will and the intelligence and the heart. Even the manner in which an affair takes place, though it's the closest thing to a romance that, that, bl that blooms in the book, is handled with quiet sincerity, and it's totally refreshing in its believability. That even though life can be blindingly fucking awful and dull and disappointing, it's still within the realm of possibility that pockets of beautiful moments can still occur. Moments that make the shit worth waiting for. Those moments described in Stoner are, like the book itself, better than food. And I'll stop there. Always remember what John Waters said. If you go home with somebody and they don't have books, don't fuck them. Seeing a lot of new subscribers out there, welcome. Glad to have you part of the family. Uh, hope you guys are all doing well. Yeah. More great stuff coming soon. Please go out and read Stoner by John Williams. Again, you can follow the link in the description box or you can head over to the website. If you follow the link, I get a percentage of anything that you buy. Anything at all. So please buy some books. You will save some money. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Talk to you guys soon. Have a great day. Ciao.